Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining this next session. It's on sustainable material, and it's about um, how best we can use sustainable materials when we're building our homes. I've got the pleasure of having Emmanuel Stefanakis and also Imran Rahman. If you please can introduce yourselves for the audience. Emmanuel, would you like to start? Yes, good morning. Thank you for this invitation. It's uh, great uh, to present on this uh, very important topic. Um, our company is based in New York State, but I personally am based in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States. Um, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer and one of the founding uh, team members at Echo Stone Housing. And uh, I'll get into the presentation on the company uh, in a second, but um, my whole career has been focused on sustainable economic development and uh, devoted to applying ecological principles to planning, design, and construction. Um, design with nature philosophy, if you will, as was coined by my university mentor many, many years ago. So I've applied this, uh, this uh, method and principles to hundreds of projects around the world. Um, including just under a million housing units in various countries. Um, uh, also, just as a little bit of background, I'm also the designer and builder of the first LEED Platinum Homes in Massachusetts and the 12th in, in the entire United States, um, which has uh, provided me with enormous uh, practical, uh, experiential uh, uh, knowledge on green building. and. Um, but getting into the topic of the day, um, we founded this company not so many years ago in order to address the major barriers uh, for uh, building housing, but especially affordable housing. And uh, there are three key factors that we've identified and which actually were, it was memorialized after we began our company by a study published by McKinsey. And that is uh, technology, systems, and finance. Uh, today, I'm gonna to focus on the technology and I'd be happy to address the other two topics at some, at some uh, later point. Um, awesome. Where, yeah, that's an introduction I'm happy to, to uh, <laughs> just go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let Imran also, um, I can tell okay. you're very excited for us to get into it, which is fantastic. But um, if Imran um, can also introduce himself, please. Yeah, I think uh, on the matter of this topic, I share Emmanuel's uh, enthusiasm, mm -hmm. um, especially so about sustainable materials. So uh, my name is Imran, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at GASH. And um, GASH is basically an advanced materials company and what we've dedicated ourselves to as a business, as a company, as an organization, is really to um, focus on what can better your living spaces. So uh, the company was founded on the, on the basis of personal problems, which is um, uh, has to do with something called indoor air pollution, which not that many people know about. And, and the main cause of this is actually something called VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. And uh, so obsessively, what the company has done is we've researched and innovated on that basis on, uh, you know, trying to identify how to remove this problem and making that indoor environment safer for everybody, especially considering we spend 90% of our time indoors. And on that basis, uh, we actually innovated our first and flagship product currently, which is a paint, which purifies the air. And our product basically, um, when painted in your home, removes these VOCs. And at the same time, it's antibacterial. It's there's no odor. It removes odors, and at the same time, it also um, removes chances of mold and things like that. So we've really sort of uh, come into this problem with an all-in-one solution. And looking at that uh, from a more macro perspective, we do realize that actually there's more relevance in terms of sustainable technologies and green technologies and technologies that can do more for you, which is why we've looked. Uh, inside the company and invested a lot more in R&D to develop new verticals of products along the lines of uh, thermal solutions and whatnot, which I'm not going to get into, uh, into today because we're not speaking about products. But <laughs> essentially, uh, you know, what we're looking at is really how to make um, your buildings, your home, your environment, your office, your hotels, whatever it is, 
more sustainable, more green, more friendly to the people who are going to stay in them. Hence, our motto of bettering, uh, bettering living spaces. Yeah. Excellent. So I, I think that's a fantastic introduction, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to get prepared for the wealth of information that the two of you are going to provide. But before we jump into it, I just wanted to just give a, a, just a, a, a bit of information. So there's activities falling under the the the, the title of shelter, the cat the category, um, specifically within the building sector, account for some forty percent of overall energy use and associated greenhouse gas emissions and the a majority due to material resource and use. So this is the reason why this particular session is really important. It's very important. So on that basis, sustainable construction should be the rule and not the exception, something that government and you know housing or building associations, etc., really take on board. So within this session, it's going to be really exciting for us to like really delve deep into looking at what sustainable um, resources actually are, um, identifying them because sometimes it's a heavy word. People are not too sure what sustainable materials are. They think it's something out of reach. And then for us to look at practical ways in which people can um, use sustainable items or equipment to be able to technology with um, their homes or their buildings. So I'm going to get started with you, Emmanuel, because I know you have a presentation for us um, that you'd like to go through. Um, you've done a few projects in Panama and also Nigeria um, as well. And you're also getting ready to do a project here in Ghana, which is exciting. So I'm going to hand over to you so that you'd be able to take everybody through um, what Echostone does and how you've been able to apply that into the building sector. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, as I said, as I mentioned earlier. We, we focus on three aspects, the technology and a paradigm shift, uh, taking, bringing the technology into the 21st century um, and, and moving through various housing systems, a way to, to accelerate the, sp the speed of construction, the velocity of construction, because uh, not only to meet the, the dire demands, but also um, to, um, to address the cost of money. And uh, if we can build homes and 14 days, as you'll see in a moment, as compared to 14 months or six months. Um, it's, uh, it's extremely important in meeting this deficit. I'd like to show you a very brief film, two days, which highlights our technology, and then I'll get into um, the specifics of it. So enjoy the ride for a moment. This is our first project in Nigeria. Emmanuel, does it have um, sound? We don't seem to be able to hear anything. Oh, it's, um, there is sound. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's music and not, um, not a narrative, but I'll happy to, okay. this is a okay. demonstration project we did in Nigeria. It was demonstrating that we could build a home in 14 days using our technology. It's focused primarily on an advanced form of concrete called CLC, cellular lightweight concrete, and the application of that concrete in this advanced forms, forming system uh, that is uh, designed and manufactured in Germany. You'll see the machine there, the yellow machine, which produces on-site in situ cellular lightweight concrete. Um, this concrete um, is a sand cement, and a foaming agent in addition to water. It, um, it, um, can you hear me now? Can you still hear me? Hello, Manuel. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I think I just lost you for a second. Okay, sorry about that. Let me, um, I'll jump this forward a bit. Yes. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you now. You, you, you right. dropped we seem to be having a little bit of a technology issue here. <laughs> anyway, uh, the application of this top technology is uh, we've used it. Uh, as I said, we're a young company. We've done a project in uh, Panama and in Nigeria. Uh, this is um, a brief overview of what we completed in Badagri, Lagos State, uh, about a year ago. Uh, it is the first edge advanced certified project in Nigeria. And I, if I recall correctly, it was only the third edge advanced project in all of Africa, which resulted in about 53% <clears throat> energy savings, 42% water savings, and 35% less embodied carbon um by applying our technology and systems um, a quick overview on our panama project <clears throat> which we um achieved uh, this was our first project ever uh, it was a 32 percent energy savings 35 percent water savings and 58 percent embodied carbon um this uh this is an interesting one because this is phase one where we had um, uh, applied our technology to an existing architectural plan but in phase two We've adjusted the, the design to make it more efficient, actually smaller, but more spacious. And uh, we've achieved over 50% energy savings uh, at the same time that we've reduced cost. So uh, this is the, the secret to our technology. It's a portable in-situ concrete factory about the size of a large SUV. It mixes uh, cement with sand a foaming agent to produce cellular lightweight concrete. And that is poured into formwork. Um, it can be poured at different densities and therefore um, have extraordinary uh, superior properties to traditional concrete while providing substantial strength. Um, we apply this primarily to single and double story structures at the moment. Um, the cellular lightweight concrete is about half the density of traditional concrete. And by injecting a foaming agent into the concrete, uh, there are millions of air bubbles which provide uh, insulation um, and a very, uh, a very good uh, comfort for individuals. In Panama, we've actually measured the, te the temperature difference between inside and outside to be over 10 degrees Celsius. Um, but equally importantly is the, uh, the sustainability, uh, embodied carbon. And uh, as you'll see in the graph, uh, these two graphs, uh, our building system is the upper graph, which just, uh, just intrinsically reduces the carbon footprint by about 40%. And this is done through the, the way production of concrete is made. That's the darkest blue area that you see. Uh, but we also, because we produce on-site and on demand, we have far less waste. We don't have heavy machinery, trucking, going back and forth across the city. And, um, and we also reduce the, the, uh, the carbon intense uh, materials of uh, coarse aggregate. And um, in terms of edge, uh, these are the ways that we apply the edge algorithm to our, our buildings to increase energy savings, water savings, and, um, and embodied carbon. That's a brief overview. Um, I'm happy to address any more questions or dive more deeply into any of these uh, any of these topics. So thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. We do have um, one question. So I'd just like to say to our um, participants that if you have any questions, please feel free to post it. And rather than waiting till the very end, um, I might ask them um, throughout our session. So I have one question here, um, which is from Michael Rada. It's asking how many of your of the properties have tenants already? Um, I'm not sure, I don't necessarily know, are you the property developer and also the person that rents mm -hmm. out the, the properties as well, or how does it work right. for you? Um, as a young company, we started off by being the, uh, the developers and contractors, which is what we did in, um, Panama and, uh, and Lagos. Uh, we currently have shifted our business model now that we've proved the concept to being a technology solutions provider. In this way, we work with local contractors and developers and um, we can have a, an exponentially larger impact on, on um, the supply of housing in different countries. So the, the, um, the project in Panama is fully occupied and the project in, uh, in Lagos is, um, 
about a third occupied, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to check the number, but still in the process of being sold. These are these are units available for sale, not for rent. Uh, having said that, the yes. I think you should tell them how much that the properties in Lagos go for the cost. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the cost, of course, is dependent on so many factors, right? The cost of land, the, the cost of local materials and labor. We tend we use all local labor. We bring in trainers, but shift the responsibility to local uh, skilled and unskilled laborers. In, uh, in Lagos, that uh, the home that you saw in the presentation is about 64 square meters, two bedroom unit, and the sale price is about $25,000. Um, the home in Panama, different economy, different uh, government, different geography, uh, those homes sell for somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars, and they're about the same size. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, um, Imran, do you have a presentation for us as well? Or should I dive straight into the questions? Let's dive straight into the questions. I don't have. Okay. A excellent. Yeah. So, I'd like us to explore like different examples of sustainable materials. As I said, um, because. A lot of the time people think they're far removed from what actual sustainable materials are, but especially within this climate that we live in, um, that it's right underneath our noses. So could we actually look at the different types of sustainable materials there are that we could actually use within our building projects? Imran, I'll go for you. Well, um, uh, for us as a uh, building materials uh, sort of supplier innovator there's a variety of materials that we can consider but um, how we like to break it down at gush is uh, into three aspects so we have materials with primary impact towards sustainability secondary impact and of course the tertiary impact so primary impact being at point of manufacturing like how does this ensure that um, our sustainable goals are met so let me give you an example. In the way that we manufacture our beams, um, we have been very cautious not to apply things like heat or um, excessive mining of uh, raw materials that might otherwise be pollutive uh, versus traditional beams, which require heat and hence have a larger carbon footprint. Um, Gush's manufacturing technique, at least for our beams, uh, involves uh, pulverization technique, which is just basically like grinding um, the raw materials into very fine uh, particles and then going through a mixing process. So in that, that's the primary impact that we assess because that's the impact of us to produce that material. Um, I will not get into the secondary impact, but in, in terms of the tertiary impacts at point of application. And uh, for us, we do believe that sometimes less is more because um, a, a core part of sustainability is about demand and supply. And one thing that's been happening is that uh, in terms of the whole like commercial conversation and, and in terms of driving towards economic growth, we're always talking about consumption and increasing demand and increasing sales. Uh, at Gash, we believe less is more, which is why we believe uh, we wanted to put all our uh, technological finesse into one singular product that can do more for you. Uh, which is why our paint has de was developed as a six-in-one solution. And with that in mind, you know, you can think of things like preventive maintenance because um, in, in Accra, for example, you know, you guys are near the coast. I imagine molding to be a huge problem. In, in places like, uh, you know, anywhere near the coast, basically humidity is a bit higher. If you're near a rainforest, you're going to have those issues come up. And, and uh, what we do on that tertiary level is to really prevent more from growing so you don't have to consume new materials to sort of fix that problem so that would be the tertiary impact so we we really want to look at this from a whole chain point of view yeah Imran, so, you've got ahead of us you've got ahead of us just a little bit i have to rain yeah. the two. <laughs> i'm so, so sorry question, about that yeah it's okay so the question is um what are sustainable materials like what are they so let's start with that so that people can actually identify with what they are within their local environment and then we'll get to um the part of how you can apply it etc etc yeah but just okay. just off the top like how do, what 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 is like because i know for example bamboo is is, is a yeah. sustainable product right so um, what other materials are sustainable um uh, materials that we would probably come across on a day-to-day -day basis that we can take advantage of okay yeah so bamboo is definitely one of them and yeah. i think another thing that's not been uh, spoken about so much is actually like algae and kelp 
Um, there are so many applications moving beyond food for like kelp, for example, because there are many companies like researching the basis of uh, how they can utilize like kelp or algae for like energy. Um, well, for for, for material you're mentioning? Kelp. Uh, kelp. Kelp or algae. Oh, okay. yeah, so I think in terms of like sustainable materials, one of the core components that we should look at is um, how long does it take to grow? Because when we talk about materials, most of them are going to be uh, natural resources that we either like mine or have to harvest. Um, maybe let me just draw a parallel here. For example, we use trees to make things like paper and um, wooden finishes and whatnot. But the issue with trees, for example, is that it takes a long time to grow. And depending on what your demand context is, you might not be able to plant enough trees or regenerate that particular ecosystem in the same way that the demand has been utilized. But for things like kelp, bamboo, you know, algae in general, they are very fast growing. And uh, what that does in terms of like sustainability in the grand scheme of things is allows you to um, sort of regenerate that ecosystem while you're consuming. So that, that really helps. And uh, I mean, moving beyond that, there are so many examples of sustainable materials, but I think this are uh, uh, the, the main two, um, algae and, and uh, bamboo that I would like to talk about just for that basis, Excellent. because it gives you a good perspective of what we should be looking at, not yeah. just about what we should not take away from our environment, but how we can uh, sort of preserve that process of the ecosystem and how we can make sure that no further damage is being done for us to urbanize, if you will. Excellent. Yeah. I, I would add, I would add uh, slightly more. Bamboo certainly is a and can be a sustainable building material. However, one needs to look at the supply chain and how that bamboo is grown and where it's sourced and what the materials used are to manu to convert it into a value-added product like fluorine. Are the adhesives, for example, uh, do they do they contain volatile organic compounds? Uh, has the bamboo been sourced from what was a mature growth forest that was cleared in order to grow the bamboo. So there are subtleties that one looks to, needs to look at when talking about sustainable building materials, not just uh, um, not just a, a superficial look. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So I have a question here, which is being. We all have okay. So, like, oh, sorry, let me just get the name um, from Victor. He's asking, what are the materials that are fed to your unique mixer to make your wall panels? So, your concrete, your your machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, he's uh, they're asking, all what are the yeah, they're 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 primarily locally sourced materials. Uh, cement is available in virtually all countries. Sand. Uh, virtually uh, available in virtually all countries. Uh, water, <laughs> uh, a scarce resource as we've heard in the area, earlier panels, but water. Uh, what, what is unique perhaps is the, the foaming agent, which is an imported material, but we use you know, a few liters per home. And it's, um, it's not, uh, not a large component of the material is imported. And all the labor is, is locally sourced, as I said earlier, skilled and unskilled. I think this is always a challenge with doing anything virtually. Sometimes a network is not that stable. So um, excuse, excuse a little hiccups. Okay, I have another question. So for your, again, for your machine, how will the savings look like for a single custom unit versus multiple units um, when, it, when you're doing a production? Well, the machine and technology is can it, be applied. I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. it can be applied to all scales and all socioeconomic levels of, uh, of housing. We as a company are focused on the affordable housing, which is low income and low middle income. Uh, and uh, in order to meet the demands, the enormous demands for uh, housing, we, that's the niche that we address. Uh, it can be customized. Uh, the panel system is modular um, and uh, can be configured in different uh, ways. Uh, 
Uh, but we are, one of the things we do is we optimize the design of the homes in order to make them not only energy efficient uh, by applying the edge algorithm, but also to minimize the number of components that we use so that the home can be erected quickly and at high speed and very efficiently. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I showed you the home that we built in the homes we built in Panama first phase and uh, because we, we were using uh, another uh, designer's home, there were a number of corners and the, the window sizes and all that. We, um, we adjusted the design and got larger window openings, better ventilation, better energy savings, at the same time reducing the cost because one has to balance the cost of a window which creates lights and ventilation with the cost of concrete. And at least in Panama, the cost of a window per square meter was less than concrete per square meter. So there's an interesting um, um, modeling that one has to do. It's not very difficult, especially with the edge tool, which we found to be extremely uh, helpful. Excellent. So um, Imran, so you, your company is Gush and Gush pr produces um, paints, if I'm correct, um, yes. which is used which has a mixture of sustainable materials inside it, and then you have air purifiers, et cetera. So um, is it only applicable to ha like housing projects or is it for corporate use or, it, or is it just limited? Like what's, what's its total usage? Um, well, in, in terms of what we've been used for so far, we've seen uh, applications from across residential to industrial and um, because of the properties of the paint, one of the things that we can do is actually absorb moisture content from the air and moisture content from the surrounding. Um, one of our most unique case studies have been um, sort of painting around um, server rooms which require temperature control, um, especially in tropical, tropical climates like Accra, for example, or even here in Singapore. Our room temperature is 28 degrees Celsius or 26 degrees Celsius, and servers have to be kept in the colder rooms, you know, anywhere between um, 8 degrees to 18 degrees, depending on what the requirements are. And what happens is that uh, the walls on the outside of these areas start to perspire, if you will, or, or tear mm -hmm. because of that mm -hmm. condensation. So this is something yeah. that we have uniquely formulated ourselves to uh, sort of address head on because we can absorb that water. Uh, so in terms of the applications, really, uh, on our end, what we feel is, is important for us to educate, to empower and let people know uh, the capabilities of what we can do uh, in terms of our product and uh, in terms of our mission, how we have to change the landscape using better building materials. So the applications are really uh, limitless. We have painted everything from one single room uh, in, in a baby's house, for example, in a baby's room, all the way down to whole factories and whole warehouses and even um, full buildings at a time, whether it's being newly built or refurbished. Yeah, um, I think that's and also the versatility behind paint because you need it in most projects. Yeah. And your paint, is it a base paint or is it an actual decorative paint as well? It can be used as both actually. So okay. we have had projects where we have been the base coat, but most of the projects uh, encompass us as the full solution. So we do the base and we do the finishing or decorating. Yeah, if you will. Um, yeah. And what did you say are the, raw, the sustainable materials that you are inside the paint, which actually help? So uh, in the case of Gush, we use um, a plant-based component that actually comes from a form of seaweed that is highly um, absorptive. So this material is actually called diatomite, and this is one of the core ingredients of the paint. It works the same way as activated carbon or uh, some of the other more porous materials that you experience in nature, but the difference between the process and how we uh, process the diatomite is that this material is readily available, it's easily sourced, um, and the processing does not require too much effort in the grand scheme of things relative to how paints are manufactured. And, and this is actually the layer that allows for us to absorb that moisture and uh, keep your walls dry if you will to prevent uh, some, some uh, more 
um, more difficult issues to solve, we will, like for example, like mold, because mold needs moisture. And the basis of that absorption also actually helps us to um, not just absorb the, the, the volatile organic compounds, but we also, in that basis uh, or in that formulation, we do have proprietary catalysts that we utilize as well uh, that break down these materials and keep it clean so that you don't have that sort of saturation in your walls just from absorbing this toxic materials or this moisture, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like a, to compliment a, you on bringing product like that to the market. I know when I was thank designing you so much. my first yeah. lead platinum home 14 years ago, there was a, uh, a desert of uh, appropriate building materials. And it's important to note that the supply chain uh, bringing uh, innovative products like uh, Imran is, uh, is uh, talking about is, is really important, uh, not only in terms of the variety of projects which help us build green and healthy and sustainably, but also the cost of materials has has come down substantially over the last decade or so. Yeah. So building green is not necessarily expensive. And as Edge will tell you, they expect to get to, to certify a home with as, as Edge, um, it's uh, less than 2%. And we've found in our projects that it's less than 1% additional cost to get the home wow. certified. Yeah. Excellent. And I, I actually like to comment on what Emmanuel just said, because one of the key challenges that we are facing as a sustainable or green facing company who's pushing for this agenda is that most people think it has to be extremely expensive and the cost basis mm -hmm. does not make sense. And it's been, uh, you know, very difficult to navigate some of those conversations because at the end of the day, we do understand that uh, businesses have to um, put profits first or, you know, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, we cannot forget that home is planet Earth and we should do our best and, and, and really have that responsibility and accountability towards, towards what we do for the environment. And on that basis, uh, what Emmanuel is doing with his company and the technologies that he brings to the table with low cost housing, with sustainable and green at the same time, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to see. Okay, yeah. I honestly think the organizers should have allowed us to have our own event, right? Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's get back to the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have given us so much information so i want to go through some of the questions because they're really piling up so the first question that we have from victor kojo is have you and um, so i think this will be for um actually both of you um have you got any contact to policymakers in ghana to solve a housing deficit in ghana now um, emmanuel i know you said that you're coming to ghana now to work on a project could you elaborate a bit on that and what mm -hmm. the process has been like yeah, my colleagues and I have been to Ghana a number of times, and uh, we are actually building a, a model demonstration home uh, currently as we speak that will be uh, announced shortly. Um, we have had some preliminary conversations with uh, policymakers um, and have gotten a very favorable response from not only them, but also developers who are in the affordable housing market. It's been a very warm reception, I, I must say. And we look forward to uh, to being more active there. So just a quick question. So your sustainable materials, is it that it can only be used for affordable housing, but can it also be used for commercial projects as well? Oh, yes. Wherever, wherever you use traditional concrete, we can apply our technology. It's just that that's the niche that our, our business is focused on. Okay, interesting. And then for you, Imran, um, is Gush available in Ghana? Is, is it? on the continent at all? Um, we are actually in talks right now with several partners within Ghana to bring um, our paints and some of our other newer products into the market. Uh, but that being said, uh, in, in terms of if you're talking about uh, networking within uh, Africa itself, we do have uh, several touch points that we have been speaking to uh, and we're still working on it right now. So we don't have anything as, as concrete uh, yeah. if you will, but there's strong interest in the market, especially given some of the recent changes in uh, policy making and, and uh, what the goals are within Africa over the next 10, 15 years. So we do see a lot of potential in the market and we are actively working on it right now. And that would be interesting because you could also, because of the um, sustainable materials that you're using, you could actually have a production plant here on the continent as opposed to, you know, importing it in from... Um, 
Singapore, you can actually eventually get to the point of producing it yes. here locally, which should again yes. will keep the cost low for the end user. Okay, excellent. So the next question is from Emma Banson. Um, hello, Emmanuel. So this is for you. How can a private builder incorporate sustainable materials in his or her building? It's actually Reverend Emma Banson. <laughs> well, I, I would... Um... one needs to do a little bit of research. And I think, I think the, the easiest way is to, to look at the Edge um, app uh, that's um, available free from the IFC. And it, it guides you through the process of looking at materials and processes um, in order to build sustainably and ultimately get your project certified as sustainable. So that's a good start. Um, Applying these um, sustainable building materials is, is, um, is, is not difficult. It just requires some thinking. As I said, in, in Panama, we actually, by, by looking at the design, looking at the specifications of the products we were using, we were actually able to reduce the cost of construction. So mm -hmm. there are advantages. It's not a time sink. It's, uh, it's actually advantageous, not just for... Uh, the design, but for the developer, the cost of construction, and ultimately for the occupants of the homes. So we found that uh, by applying this edge um, algorithm, our, our, um, the occupants of the building save in excess of uh, one third of their monthly utility bills, which in turn uh, creates a discount of, on their mortgage or gives them more disposable income to spend on their children's education or health or whatever factors. So there's, there's a cost benefit to owners as well, a significant one. Okay, excellent. Um, and then we've got Victor, who's got another question for you, Emmanuel. <laughs> he may potentially become your client very soon. Have you explored the use of um, recycled plastics as a raw material? I know we were going to have Nelson Boating, who, did, um, who does recycled plastic bricks, mm -hmm. but I guess in his absence, he can um, also respond to that question. The two parts to that question, the formwork that you see that we, where we form, uh, pour our concrete are, is, is a recyclable plastic. It's, um, it's manufactured in Europe. Uh, those forms can be used uh, tens, if not hundreds of times, depending on how well they're handled. And at the end of their life cycle, they are recyclable. Uh, they're lightweight, which also makes our, um, our construction methods, uh, let's say um, gender neutral, we like to say that are lightweight and can be handled by um, women as well as men on the construction sites. We had a number of women uh, helping us uh, on site in, uh, in uh, Nigeria, for example. Um, we are exploring ways to re further reduce the carbon footprint of our concrete, uh, including the application of recycled plastics, but we're not quite there yet. We expect, uh, we, we are just now establishing a sustainable building technology center as part of our in-house research and development initiative, where we'll be exploring the application of that and other technologies to further reduce our, our carbon footprint. Okay, excellent. So I've got Kweku Owusu, who's got a question. In a short to medium term strategy of closing our housing deficit, what is the viability of using sustainable building materials in relation to its availability, especially in Ghana? Okay, so, and, and Africa as a whole. So, you know, it's a very interesting question, Kweku, and I think it feeds back to my initial question of us elaborating a bit more on what exactly is sustainable materials, because um, it's about, do we have it available? Like, is it readily ava available outside of bamboo? And how can it can it respond to the en masse of properties or developments that we actually need to build? I think that becomes um, the other challenge. I'm not sure, Emmanuel or Imran, if you know about that, or Imran, if there's a case study in Singapore, whereas you know, you know, your your supply actually was able to meet the demand, and if it didn't, what was put in place in order to respond to that? I don't think we've, we faced uh, much problems in terms of supply chain for sustainable materials because these things have been available for a long time and they are actually readily available. It's, 
It's just that when we talk about the incumbents and, and, and the different industries that we're dealing with, there are certain things that they're used to and the status quo seems comfortable, which is why innovation is not something that they look at. And especially within a, a space, like for example, that we're in uh, construction, building materials, we have you know, many huge incumbents who have been doing business and innovating in a manner that um, they have been used to for the last 50, 60 years, you know, much longer than most of us in this call have been alive for. And having that mentality, if you will, does create a difficulty in making that shift towards doing something that's net positive in terms of when you look at it from a sustainability perspective. And this is the benefit of, of uh, I guess, what we do have in terms of a smaller uh, or a more nimble purpose-driven entity organization like Gush, where we focus on the impact that we want to create first, which is why sourcing for these materials are not a problem. But in terms of case studies and, and talking about the impact of, um, let's say, getting certain things done, this doesn't just have to be limited to a conversation with construction. Like the basis of like even foods, like for example, like Impossible Meats, um, their basis has, has, has been about like reducing that carbon impact for you to enjoy uh, a beef patty, for example, that tastes exactly like beef or meat substitute that tastes exactly the same, but created in a lab, created in a controlled environment whereby not only can this carbon footprint be quantified, not only do you not have to transport it around because all it needs a lab to grow it, but on that basis, it solves other issues as well, like food shortages around the world. So this is not just something specific to what we're speaking about here today. It goes far beyond into many different industries uh, across the world in terms of when you talk about okay. like, sustainability. Yeah. Imran, I'm really sorry. So we only have two minutes left. Two minutes. Oh. <laughs> so I've just Time flies. To go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're pinging me saying, Nadia, two minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, so I guess um, another question that I'll take another one more question from here then. So um, for existing, this is from Linda Lanque Mills. She's asking for existing developments and homes, what are some suitable materials that can be used for modification? So we've really gone um, and spoken a lot about the building blocks of the actual house, um, which we've covered clearly. And we've also spoken about, you know, the paints that can be used to ensure that the moisture and damping and stuff are not coming through. But outside of the initial, you know, infrastructure, what about the roofing, for example? What about flooring? What other um, sustainable materials can we use to build our homes or offices, churches, et cetera. Because churches, for example, I mean, they're, they're quite elaborate. They're very big. And for some churches in Ghana, we use fans in order to, high ceilings and fans to be able to, you know, push enough um, oxygen or cool air around. And there's others that just stack up ACs throughout the whole building. So what would be other options that we could use in terms of sustainable materials mm -hmm. to be able to build um, our developments. We've only got like one minute left. Yeah, there, there are many options and I'll, I'll point again to the IFC Edge algorithm because it, in, in the algorithm, there's a drop down menu with numerous building material options and you get instantaneous feedback on the carbon footprint and energy savings by applying those materials to your project. So it's, it's a very effective real-time tool. Uh, for example, if you look at what, uh, in their drop-down menu for wall construction, there are, there are no less than 20 different materials which are listed there. And you just choose one and you get an instantaneous readout. And you said that's um, on, on a website? Level. Yeah, the IFC Edge uh, Green Building Program. I believe okay. they're presenting at, uh, in this conference as well. Okay, excellent. Something to reference then. Excellent. And just, okay, I, sorry, just sorry, to add on to ahead, what Emmanuel. Emmanuel, oh yeah, just to add on to what Emmanuel was saying, because if you're talking about buildings that have already existed for a long time, uh, we don't necessarily have to speak about rebuilding it, but retrofitting has been a very useful solution over the years in terms of ensuring that uh, fundamental development of the building itself in terms of structural integrity, in terms of the systems in place, and there have been many, uh, you know, retrofitting solutions coming out of uh, the US, Europe that, that you know, 
consolidates a lot of this energy savings or water supply uh, issues within that building that can be you know, added into the existing infrastructure rather than tearing it all apart and trying to rebuild something from scratch. So like, Excellent. you know, this is not specifically a material per se, but there are a lot yeah. of solutions out there. Yeah. Excellent. Emmanuel Imran, thank you so much for your wealth of information. You are, you've been well received over here. We're very <laughs> excited for both thank of you. your products, especially Emmanuel, especially yours. Like somebody's actually saying they want to see your project in, in real life. So I think we have to arrange for them to go to Nigeria to be able to see. No, they'll be able to see it very soon. In, uh, in, uh, very Ghana. soon. Very in soon. <laughs> and to our participants, thank you so much for your amazing questions. Um, I'm sure there's a representative for Echo House. And also I can see that Imran has also been sharing some information there. So you can find them. I'm sure the event organizers will also be sharing their contact details. I'd like to say thank you very much again to the organizers as well, because we are really a green Ghana. We want to see more green houses, green communities, green cities, green buildings. And we're always the black star in everything. And I'm sure we're going to be able to succeed with this one as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for your participation and have a fantastic day. Over to yeah, you guys. You. Thank you, Nadia.